It is the President's prerogative to select the keynote speaker for this meeting. It occurred to me that with the explosive growth of the specialty in the last five years, many of our younger members may have heard but never seen one of the authentic giants of plastic surgery. Dr. Truman Blocker is Professor of Surgery and President Emeritus of the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston. His curriculum vitae and the lengthy list of distinguished surgeons who trained under him is a living who's who in surgery. His enormous list of publications runs to 212 items. His consultantships, professorial appointments, professional society memberships and honors are just about as long. He is, of course, best known for his basic fundamental contributions to the care of burns and trauma. He was chairman of the American Board of Plastic Surgery in 1961, president of the Third International Congress of Plastic Surgery from 1961 to 1963, and recipient of this and many other societies' honorary and distinguished service awards. He has been consultant to the Surgeon General of the Army since 1946 and attained the rank of Brigadier General. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present to you Professor Truman G. Blocker. Thank you, Mr. President, distinguished platform guests, ladies and gentlemen, this is a real privilege, and I, I must say that our president has worked harder and has done such a fine job that I agree with Steph. It's beyond my comprehension. I graduated from the University of Texas Medical Branch in May of 1933, 50 years ago before most of you were born. And during my medical school days in the fourth year, I became a so-called junior intern and adopted Dr. A.O. Singleton Sr., the chairman of surgery, as my mentor. Although I'd already decided to be a surgeon, even as a youngster. At least my mama told me I was going to be. Dr. Singleton was one of the last general surgeons in America who could do and did do everything permitted uh, by the anesthesia and technology of that era. And he knew all of the greats of the day throughout this country and Europe. In 1937, an organizing group of the American Board of Plastic Surgery came to Galveston at Dr. Singleton's invitation, and I was summoned over to the medical school and asked to take a picture of the charter members using Dr. Ivey's camera. A painting was made from this photograph, and Dr. Ferris Smith left it to me in his will. In the foreground are Blair, and Dorrance, and H.L.D. Kirkham, the host of the meeting, Stage Davis, Ivy, Risden, Ladd, Ferris Smith, Pierce, and Kiscadden. Dr. Singleton's predecessor as chairman of the Board of Surgery was Dr. James E. Thompson, who helped to found the school in 1891. He devised the Thompson operation for cleft lip and was, was the first, so far as I can find, to use calipers 
for measurements in the operation. When I joined the staff in 1936, Dr. Singleton told me to do the pallets and the lips since he had become a little tired of them and thought that I might be artistic because I always carried uh, and, uh, colored pencils and made drawings of my operations on patients' charts. I also inherited the burns, which then were almost, uh, were mostly old, chronically infected ones in children, sent in from all over the state. I was assigned to them partly because I was big enough to pick them up and carry them to the, from the wards down to the tubs uh, to uh, cleanse them. I made friends with them by, uh, and gained their confidence by doing tricks uh, such as play, uh, making playing cards disappear and flipping coins up my sleeve and then retrieving them from behind the, my elbows or ears. During a two-year internship at Graduate Hospital in Pennsylvania, I worked under Dr. Robert Ivey, and while serving a short period as an instructor at Columbia a Presbyterian, I came to know and admire uh, Dr. Jerome Webster, shown here with Dr. Kasanchin of Boston. In 1939, Dr. Singleton invited Barrett Brown down from St. Louis uh, to lecture and to make rounds on our um, service. Here he's shown with his wife, Bird, in 1954, uh, sometime later. And Barrett, at that time, stayed in our house and after reviewing my hospital cases, he suggested that I make application to the Board of Plastic Surgery, even though I had not had any formal training whatsoever with someone who could sponsor me. I passed the Boards in General Surgery in 40 and the Plastic Boards in 42. And shortly before the, we entered the war, Sir Harold Gillies came to lecture on our campus here he's shown with, uh, uh, on the left with Converse and, on the, and Cassandian on the right. Sir Harrow was always a bit uh, naughty. He spoke on mammoplasties, characterizing the female breasts as little chappies and with great gestures, obviously embarrassing Mrs. Singleton's club members uh, who were called the Merry Wives. Uh, about this time, I attended my first plastic surgery meeting in Kansas City, where I met Dr. Earl Paget and many of the old guard. I arranged for the purchase of a dermatome for our hospital during the meeting. We'd been cutting freehand grafts uh, prior to this time with a Blair knife. And by the way, at our annual Thanksgiving uh, party in Galveston, as Steve Lewis is home now in his 35th year, we still have the first year residents carve the turkeys with skin graft knives. From Kansas City, I went to St. Louis to visit the Blair Brown Clinic. Louis Byers and Frank and Mary McDowell and of course Barrett Brown became very good friends. And all over the United States, just then there was a great deal of squabbling about the requirements of the plastic board certification. The St. Louis contingent was insisting upon strong general surgery training, and I allied myself politically with them. At that time, there were board certified plastic surgeons in this country with dental, maxillofacial, and ENT backgrounds, all separate factions. And this battle went on into the 50s. In the spring of 42, I signed up as a captain in the Air Force, and at the age of 32, and departed in June for the San Antonio Aviation Cadet Center. About a year later, I was transferred to the Army uh, Evacuation Hospital, the uh, um, 99th Evac Hospital. which was training in the Mojave Desert. And just before it went overseas, I received orders 
to go to the, in the opposite direction, to the Ream General Hospital, which was quartered in the luxurious Breakers Hotel of uh, Palm Beach. I arrived there pretty sandy and with a red mustache, which I'd grown out, out of boredom. And in the summer of 44, I went as the head of, of the seven newly formed plastic surgery units to Wakeman General Hospital at Camp Atterbury, Indiana, just in time to receive the casualties from D-Day. Our service at Wakeman at its peak numbered more than 2,000 patients, and we kept track of them on a huge bulletin board with a slot for each patient and various colored stickers to indicate the diagnosis, the pre- and post-operative data, furloughs, AWOLs, and so forth. And during this exciting tour of duty, I had to sign to me Dr. Lot Howard, who was on leave from the hand clinic of Sterling Bunnell in San Francisco. In fact, I traveled with Dr. Bunnell on several of his uh, sojourns in the Army, and I named my son Sterling, who was born in 1948, after the two of them, Sterling Howard Blocker. And of all the following, who later became outstanding plastic surgeons, Clarence Monroe, Fred McCoy, Steve Lewis. Didn't he look pretty? Jim Hendricks, Bill Selman, Ray Brower, And later, Tom Cronin. Tom had trained at the Mayo Clinic and had had several that had served overseas prior to joining us. We learned a tremendous amount from him. We also had Colonel Roy Stout. who had been chief of dentistry in the European Theater of Operations, and he came in 1945, and he's shown here on the right with me and uh, the Surgeon General Hayes. Because I wanted jaw fractures and other maxillofacial cases to be treated on our service rather than being turned over to the dental services, I insisted upon having an oral surgery staff on the service. This was a big fight, but we won. After Colonel Stout retired in the 50s, he finished his career at the medical branch in Galveston. And he had been a regular army, and in his long years uh, in the service, he had been the personal physician, um, a personal dentist to Pershing, uh, MacArthur, Eisenhower, and many other notables. We always uh, thought of his, uh, that he thought of his residents as lieutenants. However, the uh, most of those residents thought he meant orderlies. Nevertheless, they were intensely loyal to him, and all of us were grateful for the privilege of studying with such an outstanding teacher. During my second year at Wakeman, after I became chief of surgery, the heads of the various services met every afternoon in my little room in the BOQ for the so-called children's hour as we, uh, we called it that, to, receive the, uh, to review the happenings of the day and to share a few drinks before uh, going to the mess hall uh, to eat. Among our most devoted patients were a number who had lost the entire lower uh, jaw, and after G VJ Day, when Wakeman closed, we continued to carry out procedures on them for several years. This group of patients have remained friends, and a few years ago, they formed an organization of Wakeman veterans. There's about 100 of them. This is a sample. Last year, in the summer of 82, I joined them at a resort in Minnesota for their annual retreat. It was strange to see these former patients of ours, now middle-aged men and even old men. I suppose they were surprised to see how old I was, too. 
When I came back to the medical branch in Galveston after the war, I organized a plastic and maxillofacial surgery section with first one, then two, and eventually three residents per year. Fred McCoy was our first one, but stayed for only a brief time before leaving us for Ferris Smith's service in Grand Rapids. Bill Sullivan came next, followed by Jim Hendricks, and Jim arrived in time for the Texas City disaster in 1947. Soon after, we were able to secure from a deactivated army unit near Galveston some barracks-type hospital buildings, which we called the Special Surgical Unit, SSU. We were there for seven years. Our service included general plastic, maxillofacial, reconstructive surgery, malignancies of the head and neck, and burns. Ours was a, a very close group. Steve Lewis, who had been with us at Wakeman, came after a tour of duty at Valley Forge. Cliff Snyder, who had been in the Navy, came from Miami. And both Steve and Oscar Uyor Grigori from Mexico, who was later head of plastic uh, surgery at the University of New Leon in Monterey, did pioneer studies in tissue culture. In Christmas in 1952, Fernando Monasterio uh, came, and we all fell in love with Leonor. Here are typical SSU shots. Oscar, Y.C. Smith, and Cliff, and next to me, Longacre, who was our visitor at that time, and Steve. Our service at the time of Jack Tuff's visit. Uh, Cliff is on the left and Steve on the extreme right. Uh, the staff with, uh, at the time of the visit of Dick Stark. Our group in 1952, Fernando Monasterio, is in the center, the back row, and Elias Perez, a visiting fellow from Lisbon, in the center on the front row. The staff with Littler on, our, on my right and Reed Dingman on the left, vis both visiting at the same time. Our service at the SSU also included Martin Algerber. Martin came from Switzerland. He spent a a year with us doing research. He has later become the chief of surgery and also the dean of, at Basel, Switzerland, and he's now president of the International Surgical Society. The Plastic Surgery Travel Club came after we moved into the new quarters in 1950s. You see many of your friends there. Uh, in 1953, I became a member of the surgery study section of the NIH. Many of you will recognize your former chiefs in this photograph, which included leaders in general surgery, orthopedics, and anesthesiology. I was appointed to the American Board of Plastic Surgery in 53, also as a representative of the American Surgical Association. And, uh, That uh, August body, of course, is the, uh, where research on a few rats uh, are worth more than statistics on a thousand clinical patients. In 54, the year that Barrett Brown was president of the association, I was asked to host the meeting in Galveston, and a lot of greats were there. The night before the banquet, we had a Western party at the country club with many props for photographs and bandanas and Western hats for everyone. Here are a few of the pictures taken at that meeting. This is the group with the cigar store Indian saying how. The Hardy's on the right and Ted Mills and uh, uh, on the left. The Webster's with Steve and Audrey. Um, and Stratzma and Brad Cannon. Um, Barrett Brown and Al Davis. The Kiss Cadence on the left with the Senior Straits on the right. And here are the Lewis's with a stuffed friend. 
The following year, in 1955, marked the beginning of the International Congress of Plastic Surgery in Stockholm. It was organized by Torge Skug, here on the left, with Sir Harold Gillis, the keynote speaker. I became a member of the executive committee, which was set up according to languages. Sir, Harold, Sir Archibald McIndoo and uh, I represented the English-speaking uh, countries. Professor Burian, the, one, the dean of European plastic surgery and a much beloved figure, represented the Slavic group. Nicholas Blockin, one of the three delegates from Moscow, uh, Blokhin, Petrov, and Vishnevsky uh, was the Russian representative. Here he is in the middle uh, with uh, Jackson on the, your left and uh, Kurt Arts and Gunnar Torsen uh, in this group. This was the first time that Burian had been allowed out of Czechoslovakia since World War II and the first time so we heard that the Russian delegates were permitted to come to a meeting without an escort. Unexpectedly, Vishnevsky asked me to edit and read his paper on the so-called sleep treatment of acute burns, in which he advocated the use of large quantities of a weak Novocaine solution injected around the adrenals to control shock. And Virginia sat with Professor Kilner from Oxford at the fabulous banquet in the gold room of the town hall in Stockholm. In 59, Cliff Keene is our leader. Uh, seven us, of us went for two weeks to visit hospitals in the Soviet Union just prior to the Second International Congress in London. There were three blockers in the group. We took our 19-year-old son, Bo, Wally Stephenson, and Clarence Strotsma, and Herb Conway. Herb in those days looked just exactly like Stalin and caused gasps of shocked surprise wherever we went. And Stalin at that time uh, was still in the tomb with Lenin. We were royally entertained by the three Soviet doctors whom we had met four years before in Stockholm. We had dinner at Vishnevsky with his family at his dasha which happened to be about 100 yards from Khrushchev Dasha. We watched him do open heart surgery in his Surgeon General's uniform using ice water as hypothermia. And at the Sklifosovsky Institute, we saw Petrov demonstrating the stapling machine operating upon a case of relief of stricture of the esophagus with a jejunal transplant and using transfusions of cadaver blood. We spent a day at the Cancer Institute with Blockin, who was director and also he was president of the Academy of Medical Sciences. We saw a ward of nine patients who had lost their entire nose from bites by wolves. We, we saw and did a lot. We even got arrested and held for three hours. We never knew why, but this was probably the high point of our trip. <laughs> Our host in Leningrad was Sir Alexander uh, Limburg, here with Steph and Bo, my son. Truly one of the great plastic pioneers in the techniques of shifting of skin flaps in ingenious ways for the repair of wound defects. When I think of Herb Conway, I always remember the antics of Pete Moran of Washington, who at one meeting dived off of a 20-foot board into a swimming pool when he is fully dressed in his tuxedo just to collect a bet of ten dollars. At the first meeting which we attended in Washington, he had arranged with J. Edgar Hoover, Hoover for us to be on, the, on file as criminals uh, and for association members to hear a fake Russian broadcast which mentioned some of us. In Dallas once, uh, he stood near the door inside Neiman Marcus and called out loudly, turn around, honey, let me have a look at you and at every woman who passed, and most of them did, muttering, who is that crazy Texan? <laughs> he loved to tease Herb Conway, and at meetings would get some members' wives 
uh, wife to call uh, on the telephone in a disguised voice and ask him to meet her in a bar just for a drink. Then as Herb came rushing down out of the elevator, Pete would jump out from behind a pot plant and laughing like Hawkeye in MASH. Actually, on one occasion, he bet us all $50 that he could have his hand on the breast of the next woman who came through the door in five minutes. We each had to pay our $10. <laughs> This reminds me that during the Co Korean uh, conflict, I went in 1953 as Army consultant to Japan and Korea, traveled back, uh, traveled uh, along the lines of combat in a flimsy helicopter uh, with a rock, big rock on one side, of, on the side of the pilot uh, to help balance it. And I visited some real MASH hot units, including the one where Kurt Arch was was stationed. I was impressed with the rapid transportation by choppers and by the use of whole blood transfusions through the multiple portals, which saved many lives. During the night, we watched uh, our artillery fire, and uh, Kurt made me a baked Alaska with a tiny electric ice cream maker and a blowtorch to brown the meringue on top. Just prior to this trip, I participated in several atom bomb research projects at Camp Mercury in Nevada. I'm the one in the middle. This was good preparation for a visit to Hiroshima, where I lectured at the medical school and operated upon several A-bomb maidens. In 1960, I was chairman of the American Board of Plastic Surgery. And here is a cartoon made at the time and presented to each of us by Jimmy Johnson of Los Angeles. I was president of the Third International Congress of Plastic Surgery, which met in Washington in 63. I had meanwhile turned over the chairmanship of surgery uh, at the medical branch to Steve Lewis uh, when I became head of the Department of Surgery. And here we are crying over my plaque. Here's some other pictures from this meeting. Dinner at the Mayflower with distinguished guests. Here are the Websters, uh, Dave Matthews and, from London and his wife, towards Skoog in Virginia uh, in the foreground. The Executive Committee of the Congress, beginning at the left, Carl Schuchart, Olga Burian, Professor Burian, Skoog, Savonero Rosselli, and others. Uh, on the other side of me, Dave Matthews, the stenographer, Malbec, Morel Fatio of, of Paris, and Ray Broadbent. The officers at the head table after the banquet, us, the McDowells, the Willie Whites, I understand he's at this meeting and I'm glad, the Broadbents, the Matthews, and this uh, photograph. Presenting, also presenting the gavel to Savonero Rosselli who was the host at the Fourth Congress in Rome, and Antia, who is to be the host at the next Congress in India, the ninth. In 64 to 74, I happened to be the executive director of a medical branch in Galveston, and later president. In February of 77, I went for two years as acting president of the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston, Meanwhile, I had been very much involved in acquiring for the medical school in Galveston a truly first-class history of medical library. And this project still takes a good bit of my time and since I'm working still on a half-time basis. I missed the Fourth International Congress in Italy and the Fifth in Australia. I attended the Sixth in Paris in 75, and in 76, Cliff Snyder and I went to visit the haunts of the great Renaissance surgeons throughout Italy and France. I talked about this trip at the society meeting in Houston when Jim Hendricks was president. I don't write anything anymore. I just give talks on old books. About 20 years ago, I became a rock hound. And at the 7th Congress of Plastic Surgery in Rio, 
Here I am on the stage with Dr. Baruti. I took off in a taxi between sessions to visit the rock and gem shops and buy some rough stones for faceting. You get to be an expert. Our surgeon son, Sterling, went with Virginia and me to Brazil, and this was a great idea to take him along because in the evenings when nothing official was planned, he could take his mother out to dinner while I rested in bed, admiring my rock purchases and watching Donald Duck in Portuguese on television. <laughs> I was highly gratified at the 8th Congress in Montreal this summer to hear reviewed each morning the recently truly exciting advances in plastic surgery. And I feel that our specialty rests on a sound foundation. I wish I could start over again. Steve Lewis, Steve Lewis tells me that approximately 90 residents have completed their training in Galveston at the University of Texas, in addition to many foreign fellow, fellows for short or long periods of time. For example, Fortunato Benaim of, Mon of Buenos Aires and Fernando Monasterio of Mexico City, whom I have already mentioned. The two of them escorted me to South America in 68, the year I had the Foundation Award. And a member of my, a number of my former residents have been members and chairman of the American Board of Plastic Surgery, and several have been president of one or more of the principal organizations. As a matter of fact, Jim Bennett is the new president of the association. And uh, J.B. Lynch, here with Gene, takes over at the end of this meeting as president of this society. I'm sorry that Scotty Bennett's uh, picture was out of focus. And Jim sent it to me. I don't know why he let it get out of his uh, office out of focus. I'm extremely proud of our boys and grateful to them for organizing the Blocker Lewis Society, which Steve and I and I are with uh, Virginia and Audrey at the unveiling of the medallion. And as, as I look through my slides and photographs and think over the years, I'm saddened to realize that how many of the greats in plastic surgery of whom I have stood in such awe are gone. Of course, some of our trainees will be the new greats, but we used to have a lot of fun when we were all young, or at least younger. I wish I could hear Tom Becker once again play the piano and sing Gladys Isn't Gladys anymore. And to listen to one of Gil Ede's truly inspired farewell skits for departing residents. This is a great team. In fact, I've dubbed them the A-team. Dave Graham, Tom, J.R. Smith, Wes Washburn, and Gil Eden. Finally, on one last tidbit of my store of memories, in the summer of 1972, while I was president of the medical branch, I was asked to serve simultaneously for a few months as head of the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. They furnished me an airplane, and many times I would go back and forth twice in the same day. This was during a period of typical academic political turmoil, and I first directed that all the faculty members stop talking to the press and to register their complaints only through proper channels. Of course, this action was duly reported in a newspaper cartoon, the reason of which was given to me by the artist. It portrays plastic surgeon's first operation. I think this is a good time to stop and good, uh, and good advice for us all. And I'm sure with the potent editorials of your president, President Gordon, will agree with this. <laughs>